and and here we go. We are back, everybody, with another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live with our new banners. Woo! <laughs> Got our new fancy banners, and we have an amazing guest today. I'm Mary Fran Bontempo with my buddy Kristen Smedley, and today we have a good friend of ours, Jennifer Lynn Robinson. Jennifer has certainly had her share of of challenges and um, has really. Um, become a, a huge proponent of building community and building tribes and her business is Purposeful Networking. Um, and she's just got some really wonderful uh, thoughts about not only how to get through challenges, but again, how to, especially in this challenging time, to continue with that sense of community that we also desperately need. Yeah. So welcome, Jennifer. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. We're delighted. So um, you had, well, first of all, tell us just a little bit about your, your background, like, you know, where you're from and, and what your experiences were. And then if you can touch a little bit on what your challenge was, and then we'll move on to the other stuff. Sure. Um, born and raised in the Philadelphia area. I've never lived anywhere else. Me either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, at this point in my life, I wish I had, but that's a whole other yeah. segment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I went to Haverford College, Villanova Law School, and uh, worked as a litigator for about 12 years. Um, I had a near-death accident in 2008. I was a pedestrian on the University of Pennsylvania campus, and I got hit and pinned underneath a truck and almost oh, died. my God. Uh, so yeah, so that was... Um, uh, I was very fortunate at the time to be that close to a level one trauma center at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, obviously from there, um, I had to give up my career. I couldn't litigate my cases anymore. And I was a newlywed, so I was like newly married and basically had to, you know, not only heal, but reinvent my entire life at the same time. Gee, that sounds terrible. That was the entire, <laughs> you had to reset oh, the my entire gosh. thing. Yes, even everything. I mean, literally from, you know, from, from not being able to walk on my own to not getting up the stairs of the townhouse we owned at the time, not being able to oh dress my myself, wash my own hair, you know, obviously drive for many months, um, you know, mental problems that I developed, PTSD, uh, anxiety, depression, anger issues, all kinds of <sighs> physical injuries, surgeries, uh, cognitive impairments, speech impairments, you know, um, the, what really took me out of practice actually was not the physical stuff. I mean, initially, obviously there was physical stuff, but it was more the brain injury uh, because I couldn't remember my cases and I couldn't find words that I wanted to say and I couldn't think on my feet anymore. And you have to be so quick as a litigator, you have to be able to cross-examine people and, you know, adapt really quickly to what's going on in front of you that may not be what you prepared for. I couldn't remember my files. Um, so that was super challenging because I was definitely one of those people, like I'm a type A planner and I'm sure pretty much since birth I've been like that if I really think about it. <laughs> um, so I feel like, you know, my dad is an attorney. Um, I'm, I'm in a family of attorneys, but growing up my dad was a litigator and I pretty much knew from a young age that's what I wanted to do. Not only to go to law school, but to be like a courtroom lawyer. So when that was taken away from me, all of a sudden that was really tough. I can imagine. I, I don't think that we have ever, I mean, Kristen and I talk about our challenges and, and certainly they were challenges, but I don't think we've ever spoken to anybody who quite literally had to pretty much learn life again. Yeah. And, and not like learn just the basics of life again, let alone reinvent a career or reinvent, you know, personal life on the basis of challenges. You just had to do it all. How, where did you even begin? Like Kristen said, where'd you even yeah. start? Yeah, I mean, you know, you start obviously with your most immediate needs. So, I mean, in the immediate, I had, you know, many, many broken bones and surgeries and I had a collapsed lung and a hemorrhage in my eye and I was in the ICU and the trauma ward. And then, you know, after that, I was at home for two months with a pen care at home coming in every day to help me manage. Like I couldn't even get to the bathroom or get my medicine on my own and that kind of thing. And then when they decided I was well enough, they took me in a van because I couldn't drive to uh, Bryn Mawr Rehab for about seven months. Um, so like every day I would go and have speech, cognitive, vestibular, and physical therapy. And then after that, um, I treated with ReMed, which is a place in Paoli that deals with people with traumatic brain injuries. Um, and you know, that's kind of just like the immediate of it. Um, you know, over the last 12 years, there's been um, a number of <laughs> surgeries and challenges and rehab and PT and medications and therapy and nightmares and sleep problems and 
anything you can think of. So, I mean, I guess going back to your original question, you start with the immediate, which is like getting physically well enough to, you know, take a deep breath on your own and get dressed and wash your own hair and celebrate those small challenges. But then once you're kind of out of that immediate kind of zone of danger where you realize, you know, I'm not going to die and like, you know, these bruises and the bleeding and all this stuff, it, it is going to heal eventually. Um, you kind of left more with the mental stuff, which is a lot harder to struggle with um, and to, you know, recover from. Um, so, you know, in the immediate, um, I would say within the first month of my accident, I started seeing a psychologist. Oh, good. And, you know, long term after that, I mean, in the, in probably the four or five years after I first had the accident, I saw her every week. And then in addition, I saw psychiatrists and I saw a traumatic sleep specialist and I was on medication and, you know, all kinds of things that you can think of to help me try to manage through that, which initially I was not doing well at all. And, you know, I recognized that right away that this wasn't going to be something I could solve on my own. Um, you know, I, you get to a point where, you know, I remember being in the hospital and thinking like, you know, I'm special. Like, I know that sounds crazy, but you know, you think like I'm special, like, you know, you turn on the news every day and people get hit by cars and trucks and they die right there. So, you know, when you're in the hospital and you're like, somehow I made it through this when most people don't, you know, but after that, there's a real sense of anger, um, at least that I developed, um, where everybody around me was going on with their lives with normalcy and I wasn't, including my husband who I had a ton of resentment about because I would just watch him leave for work and come home and tell me about his day and whatever happens. And even though that was super boring for him and just normal, I was jealous and resentful and angry that like I couldn't go on with my life in the way that it had been. You're still trying to figure out how to brush your own teeth. Exactly. And, and somebody and, and everybody else. And I think that happens a lot when we, you know, we experience a challenge and our community kind of rallies around us, which of course they do, but then everybody eventually has to get back to their own stuff. And then you are left with the probably almost going through stages of grief. A lot of grief. I mean, there's so many stages like, you know, I've never had an alcoholism problem per se, but I know, you know, they talk about the different stages and things mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, I think there's probably charts that are similar with the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Um, you go through a lot of emotions and stages and you have to go through them just like anything else. You have to go through them. Right. You can't really ignore any of them to get past it. Yeah. Um, you know, the reason I was mentioning the part about everybody else was going on to their lives is I think it's really particularly something good to mention in light of like where we are right now taping this, which is in the middle of like a crisis pandemic. Mm -hmm. I actually, I mean, I know this is going to sound strange, but even though there's a lot of negative to the situation right now, I actually feel a little bit of a comfort level with being in the same boat as everyone. And I don't mean, you know, there's people definitely worse off. Like I don't mean to minimize yeah. people that have people that are in the hospital and, and all the other challenges that are going on financially and everything else. But to have gone through what I went through on my own and be the only one dealing with it when the world goes on around me, this is an entirely different situation where we're all forced to deal with it and have the stages and adapt, but at least everyone around you can sympathize in some way because they're all going through it. So I don't feel alone the way I did. Yeah. So, so you just verbalized something that I, I have never talked about and I guess I forgot all about when, when Michael, my oldest was diagnosed as blind at four months. And I remember sitting and watching like in the play groups and, and all that. And I would think, God, you know, your kid is, can do all of that. And mine can't. And I, and I now have to go and I have these appointments with, with the specialists and, and all of that. And I forgot all about that piece of it that everybody else was getting to have their their normal little life and i was still i and i do re, i do recall that my mom had told me i was in the stages of grief also i had never known what that was that i was grieving the loss of the life i was i had dreamt about right yeah but i forgot man you just like hit a big piece of my heart that i forgot all about watching life go by and we are in in a maybe that's why i feel i've been feeling guilty about seeing all the good in in this situation now because we are all in it at the same time right right I we're all in it. Put a, yeah. a word to that and now i know what that is i'm relating it back to that loneliness before yeah i mean at the beginning when you guys were introducing me and you were talking about community i mean i am all about building community and connection so you know to me i mean certainly there are a lot of negative things going on but it's also such an opportunity right to bring people together yeah, and I, it's, I, you know, it's funny because many people won't do that on their own. Many people, for whatever reason, aren't comfortable with it or hold back. And we'll talk about some of that in your work now, too. But nobody has a choice now. 
Like we have to, we, we really have to, if you want to stay connected, you're going to have to go out of your comfort zone most likely and find new ways to do that. So I mean, I'll tell you, I, um, I despise things like this, like <laughs> Skype, go to meeting, like, like technology, seeing myself on video. Like people have been telling me for years, you need to do webinars and you need to do this and you need, and you know, when I have to, when it's required of me, I do it. But other than that, have I ever done it on a regular basis? told myself I'm going to get adept at it, make my background or lighting look better, anything like that. Never. Because I like being with people in person and connecting and being in front of like a conversation and audiences. Um, so it's been really interesting to be thrown in this kind of like, you know, uh, river of crocodiles, you know, so to speak, where um, it's either like change or die, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and most of us are rising to it, I think. Oh yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I'm rising to it more than I thought I would. I, I'm surprising myself, but I think everybody, I mean, it actually surprised me that we're only a couple weeks out and I would say maybe one and a half to two weeks in, and now we're, I think at week four of this, I was surprised by how many people, business owners, companies, organizations had already pivoted in such huge ways because yeah. they had to, like, I can't believe how quickly it happened. Yeah. 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 That's what we were talking to Jen Crompton yesterday with, with yeah. the, uh, the gym that you go to and yeah. the fact that she was just like, boom, online and doing the, cl and, and taking off like that. It's just, but you know, she used a word yesterday. She's like, that's what leaders do. Yeah. I saw that. I watched her show. I mean, I love and her. I love her. And, her. and I guess yeah. we, we are in a lot of the same communities and we do hang with, what's that, what's that quote? You're the average of the five people you spend time with. And we do yep. tend to hang in more of leader circles. Yes. With, with our networks and our tribe. And also, of course, we, you know, we just, well, we just decided to turn on our laptops, you know, <laughs> I still keep trying See to bring happened, lighting. Yeah. it doesn't make my hair look ridiculous. I'm like, oh, well, we just, but this is also a great time that I don't think people are realizing. And I'm sure that you'll agree. It's a great time to, to fail because right. everybody's <laughs> failing. Yes. So you're trying, no, totally that agree. doesn't work. Great. Try everything. If it fails, oh, well, there was a big pandemic. Right. Well, <laughs> totally great. Well, and, I think know, we I have a tendency. <laughs> well, we have a tendency to overthink things when we have too much time. I think. Yes. And now we don't have time. Now we well, we we either do. We have an endless amount of time, but we also don't have the time to sit around and wait for something to happen that changes this thing for us. We have to figure it out now and on our own. So I think that's probably why a lot of people were jumping in. So when you had to, when you finally got your physical self in hand a little bit and you could move on what because you had to reinvent your career what were you finding with the with this part that we call the rise what were the things that you wanted to sort of embrace that you were finding okay i can't do that anymore but i can do this right so for me i mean i've always been like somebody who's over scheduled in the best way like over involved you know trying to build communities connect with people like that's always been who i am at the core um, so, you know, even when I was a practicing attorney, you know, I worked for bigger insurance companies, like, you know, most recently before I left my last role, I was with AAA Mid-Atlantic in-house, which was a wonderful company to work for. And I was really involved with their volunteerism efforts and I would plan our activities for our office. And I was involved in their Northeast regional, you know, conference, like all of that stuff. So that's been something that I always gravitated towards. Um, so, you know, the idea of finding a way to continue to connect people definitely appealed to me. Um, I had seen a lot of need of trying to be that liaison for people, um, to put them together. And that's initially when I started the business, what my goal was at the time, you know, it's, it's moved away from that. Like a lot of businesses do, but really, I mean, what did I try to aspire to, um, at the time I wanted it to be exactly where it is now, of course, making more money. Like we all would like to make mm. money, but exactly where it is now in the sense that it's mainly a public speaking and training business. When I started it, it was almost a hundred percent consulting because I was not well enough to do the public speaking. And I was being told in therapy that that was not going to be realistic for me. Um, that was probably the hardest moment for me to just be in therapy and be told, you know, you really need to rethink like a plan B because it's not going to be realistic for you to do the public speaking that you were doing before. So they were saying that definitively, like not only just not now, they were saying, forget it. They weren't saying it could never happen. I think they were trying to kindly say like, what else is on the plate? You know, if, we, if you don't get to the point where you were, you know, which, which we don't think is going to be that realistic for you. Right. You know, what else are you going to do? And in my mind, I was like, there is nothing else. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to figure um, this out. That's what I'm yeah. going to do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, 
every time I do an interview, uh, you know, it's about the story. I feel like I talk about the whole, tell me I can't, you know, and I, I'm such a stubborn person. And I think that helped me survive what I went through. And that also helped me thrive afterwards. You know, I think that, uh, uh, just being told that that wasn't going to be realistic just made me even more, you know, I'll show them, you know, yeah. they don't know what I, I can do. Right? I keep telling my husband that my stubbornness is underrated. It really <laughs> is underrated. It's a fine quality. Maybe right. not, maybe not when we're having a discussion, but generally speaking, it can really, yeah. it can really lift you when you get that in your head. Like, don't tell me I can't do it. Right. So how did you then like, what did you do to, so you had this desire to do this. So what did you start, institute, create? Like, how did yeah. you move this forward? So as I said, initially I started the business doing consulting and all of my network was in the legal community and I was no longer in the legal community. So that was the point where I first learned, you know, very quickly and a very hard lesson, which is not to have all your network in one basket, which was all the legal industry. So I had to really get out and hustle at the time and create, you know, a network and find resources and, you know, have people learn who I was and the brand recognition, you know, nobody knew who I was in, in any other community except for in civil litigation in Philadelphia to some extent, you know, and not even really there. So, <laughs> so, you know, that was really challenging. So I guess in the course of doing that, um, I made a lot of mistakes, like a lot of new business owners do. And then I realized I could help other people not make those mistakes. You know, there were a lot of new business owners who were like me, who I had never planned to run a business. I really didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Um, it was never something that I aspired to. I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs, like none of that. Um, so I had no, you know, I had no real resources, community, anybody to help me build up, you know, uh, anybody to help me with pretty much anything I needed for the business. And I made all those mistakes where I spent money on the wrong things and I joined the wrong organizations and I let people waste my time. And, you know, I did things for free that I shouldn't, and I didn't charge it. You know, I made all those mistakes. Oh my God. You're just, you're making me so happy right now because that's like, I was that's like exactly my list of stuff thing. that I've done over and that. I'm like, man, Jen's got it all together. Look at her. She gets crushed in a car. Oh. Up and no, I never. I. I mean, and and tell. And let me say this. You know, before I even continue, I don't have it all together. You know, I started about seven years ago. I still don't have it all together. I still make mistakes that I learn from. And I feel like you know, if you don't admit that, like you're just lying. You know, I mean, I made more of them early on, but I, it's not like I'm not making them still. But you're so good oh, at phew. what you do. I had no idea that your journey had that much failure. I love you even more. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> we love a good screw up here. We just yeah, love it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had some good ones. I had some good screw ups. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I started doing the consulting, essentially helping people with networking and, you know, kind of grew it over the years into, I want to be in front of audiences and companies and law firms and conferences doing this stuff. Um, so, you know, really just grew it into where it is. And, you know, finally, I would say a few years ago, I got to a place where I felt like I couldn't even try to tell the more personal story, which is some of what I've shared with you guys. I wasn't even in a place where I could talk about that without completely breaking down. And I still have my moments where I break down when I talk about it. It depends on the day. It depends what I'm talking about. Yeah. Depends who I'm talking to, you know, but I feel like a couple years ago, I thought, you know, I can start to try to do this. And my first few attempts were spread out and they were disastrous. Um, you know, and I've seen people talk about things way more traumatic than what I've gone through and do it with poise. And I, I thought I'm never going to be one of the people who can get to this point. Um, and I feel like I'm a lot better about it now. And I've also realized that you don't have to be perfect to make an impact. You know, if it's not perfect, if I stumble, if I forget things, if I lose my train of thought, if I cry for a minute, you know, as long as I don't break down, I can get through it. It's not as though I'm not making an impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your story is, is it, you literally changed lives. I mean, and I've known you, we've both known you for how many years and you just did it again. Well, first of all, that we're cheering that you failed. Aren't we good people? We are such good. <laughs> Yay for failure. <laughs> <laughs> but also that you brought up a piece of my journey that I had, I guess I had pushed so far down. Like you really, and, and when you say your name to people that know who you are, which is a bazillion people around here, everyone has the same reaction. Oh my God, I love her. Every, everybody has that same reaction. She's incredible. I mean, that's nice to hear, but I have to stop you because it's not true. I do have some enemies and I have them. <laughs> oh, I thought you had the haters. That clear, Cause it's not like all rainbows and you know, and I, you know, I can hear my husband in my ears and it's, it's not like, I feel like I've gotten to some amazing place where, you know, I have the name recognition of like a Brene Brown or something, which I would only aspire to, but 
you know, as, and I'm sure you guys have seen this with your own businesses, as you put yourself more out there, even if it's locally or on a smaller scale, um, the more haters come out. Yeah, and, I mean the people yeah. in your tribe. Your tribe is huge. and My tribe is great, yeah. It is, is very connected with you because you are such a giver. You know, that whole Bob Berg thing about being a giver, and you really are. Oh yeah, I saw your stuff when because uh, you that helped me too with about the haters thing when you were posting about and people were like, oh, you've really arrived. You're really out there making right. And you know what? I didn't think that at the time, but now I'm like, they are right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. You know, you said something that really struck me when you said it took you a while to be able to talk about your experience. Yeah. Because I had that same, you know, with my situation with David, it, it's so traumatizing. And, and regardless of the trauma, everybody has to process it in their own way. And people have been saying to me for years, oh, you have to write a book about this. You have to write a book. And I was just like, leave me alone. I'm not ready to talk about that right now. You know, you have to find a place to put it so that it doesn't overcome you and give yourself the grace to do that. But one of the things that you said that Chris and I talk about a lot was this whole idea of letting things evolve. So you start right. with something, not knowing where it's going to end up, necessarily yeah. with an idea, but not necessarily knowing exactly. And you follow along with like that evolution. You don't be married to the outcome before you get to the end of it. No. In fact, I actually started with a different business name. And in the first year after I had spent thousands of dollars on expensive lawyers um, to do the trademark and the LLC and all of that, I changed the name. Uh, and my husband thought I was insane. You know, you just spent all this money. Like, you're really going to change it. You haven't even given it a chance. And I'm like, no, this is the right thing to do. I know it is. And the earlier I do it, the better. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, so your brilliance, and I have to say, um, yes, your tribe is huge. But even people who are not in your tribe, at least not initially, um, know who you are because of the way you conduct yourself and because of the way you have built your tribe. A few years ago, when I was just starting all of this, um, I was working with somebody who was, you know, trying to give me a coach for lack of a better word, although we should, I don't know that she would, she would call herself that, but regardless. So she was saying, okay, so here's what you need to do. You need to do this, you need to do that. You need to get in touch with a couple of people. You need to connect with Jennifer Robinson. I hear that so much. <laughs> you need to connect with Jennifer Robinson. Right. And at the time I was like, well, who the heck is Jen? She knows everybody. She this, she that. And honestly and truly, I did. I, I don't know when you and I first met. I don't even recall exactly when, but I did seek you out because of that. that. And the idea that you approach people with just this authentic desire to say, you know, what can I do for you? Who can we introduce you to? Yeah. Where do you fit? And this whole idea of building a community, that's your brilliance. Oh, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that because, you know, I, I am really about that. And I've seen, you know, I think for me, the reason I'm so gung-ho networking is because that's how I've grown my business. You know, 100% how I've grown my business. And I've seen how I've been able to grow it through networking and also how appreciative and how many steps I can leap when I've had somebody give the right word about me or the right introduction and how I might get into a place that I wanted to speak two years before it might've happened or might've happened never because somebody said, you know, have you considered Jennifer Robinson? You should really look at her. Um, so, you know, I've seen the power of that and I feel like, um, you know, people just want to be given a chance, you know, and, uh, if you put that out, like, you know, I always talk about networking karma. I mean, I'm a really big believer in you put things out and they will come back to you. Um, it's not a like tit for tat, keeping score kind of situation, but I truly believe if you're connecting with the right people, it will come back to you. Have there been people I've helped that, um, you know, I feel like I wish I hadn't helped them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. We all yeah. have those gems. We all have that. I like what you said about leaping. Like that yeah. whole idea of, of when you make these connections, one of the goals is instead of having to plod through the whole way, all these little steps, you can jump over some of them by making some of these connections. Yeah, because, like, you know, we always talk about that whole people are going to do business with people they like and trust and credibility and all that. And all of those things are super important. But if you build that with enough people, you have ambassadors, you know. Um, if somebody oh. says like, this is somebody that you should hire or, you know, you should talk with, or would be a good MC for your event, you know, that goes a long way. Um, even if they don't know you. 
Yeah, I mean, especially because, as we all know, and in the world of social media, um, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. You know, you put out there what you want people to see, but like you said, that personal connection, that personal recommendation, when someone knows you and can say, on top of what your professional credentials might be, hey, this is the person you want, that's a big deal. Yes. So, so let me ask you this, because your brilliance really is, like, like Mary Fran said, about building community. And, and I, I got to tell you, I was sitting there thinking, what is Jennifer Robinson doing now? Because when you, if, if you guys follow her, every day you're in like a breakfast, a lunch, you're, you're speaking, you're doing this, then you're at a dinner, then you're at a cocktail party, and, then, and you're posing on red carpets. And I'm like, so how are you keeping this whole community and still building your network while you are there with your your fireplace behind you yeah yes and my i don't know if you can see my lily easter bunny your bunny <laughs> and, a so dog, and a dog somewhere and your yeah. puppy <laughs> <laughs> um, you know it's it's challenging i mean i i feel like um like most things i mean i've jumped in like everybody to try to manage it in a positive way um and i think you know just going back to the journey that i've had you know at some point and i don't mean on my own i mean with all the help that i've already talked about i got to a better place about the whole thing to have some perspective on it and to realize you don't want to stay in a negative place um i've you know had people very close to me namely my mother who was one of those people that let things define her and stayed in a negative place even though she had so much to offer the world that she didn't see mm -hmm. so i don't want to be that person i'm not that person uh so even in a situation like this you know as i said earlier would i rather be like in a fancy dress like talking to people at the union league right now sure but you know not that i don't love you guys we could all be at the union league but That's you know right. I mean, there you, you, know, go. Adapt, <laughs> you know i feel like uh you have to adapt um i like i think the first or second week maybe the second week i started a facebook group called the social survival guide um oh and i love, I love that yeah days. like we have like over two thousand members um and it's really just a place for positivity so I, there's you know i have rules like there's no politics there's no resources even, even though that's helpful. I don't want people to come on there and see people that say, um, you know, I've, I've lost all my income, what should I do? There are ton I'm not saying that's not important. There are tons of wonderful resources and groups yeah. for that. I want it to be an escapism. So all that people are allowed to put there is ways to virtually connect with each other for free. Uh, what they find out there that's interesting or great or human, human interest stories or things of value that are along those lines. So it's been a great community. Um, the feedback about it has been amazing. Like a lot of people will say, you know, I went on there and found things to do with my kid or, um, you know, I went on there and we watched the Alvin Ailey ballet or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for starting this community. So I think, you know, we, we inherently find ways to build community even when everything around us crumbles. We find ways to, you know, kind of work to our core strengths. And so I did that. I've been um, showcasing local businesses every day on social media. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of this. I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, virtual connecting and, uh, you know, talking to people in that manner. Um, you know, sending out cards. I've been sending out cards to people, you know, just to, I love sending out cards. So oh, that's yeah, cool. I mean, I, I'm finding ways to connect with people. And that's what's cool because that's what we want our, our viewers and our listeners to understand that it doesn't, your sucker, I mean, I, the three of us had some serious life sucker punches. Yes. And, and people don't necessarily have to have a massive thing like that, but, but they tend to get, you know, they can't get in the reset mode over something that isn't as big as blindness or a car crash and, and um, a drug overdose. So, but see, but you still were able to reset, rise, and, and then look at how brilliant your, your life has become and all the stuff that you've done um, when you just take those, those steps. I do have one more question when sure. I just mentioned the word reset. If we can go back for a second, when you were saying about like within a month, you went to a psychologist and you, and you knew that you wanted to get your life back together. Was that all you, or did you have somebody else cheering in your corner saying you got to do this? You know what? It was at that point, I've had tons of people. I don't want to make it seem like I haven't had tons of support and people cheering me on along the way. But at that point, it was really all me. Um, I had seen over the first few weeks of coming home from the hospital, I was in ICU for a week and then I was home and I could see that things just not, were, were not right in my head. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I was just sitting, crying. You know, my husband would come home from work and ask what I did with the last eight hours and I wouldn't be able to give him an answer. I didn't watch anything. I didn't do anything. I didn't eat anything. I didn't go anywhere. I don't know what I did with my eight hours. Yeah. I wasn't sleeping. I was having nightmares. So I, you know, I, I realized very early on after a few weeks of that, that 
you know, there was no way that I was going to be able to handle this on my own. And I think that's important because so many people say to me, well, it must be nice that you have this support network. It is, it's, it's mm -hmm. magnificent, but there's not a lot of people that have a big tribe or somebody cheering, you know, non -stop. we talked to Tiffany Smiley last two weeks ago and her husband that was blinded in, in Iraq, you know, as a soldier, she was his one that was like, okay, here's how you're going to go. Not everybody has that. So you right. can, my point is that you can be at your, the bottom of that pit. And, and tap into your own, we all have it. We all have it inside, your, your resilience to have that conversation with yourself to just take those steps. Yeah, I mean, you know, and you know, you have to be willing to see what's on the other side of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and don't, and don't ignore that voice. I mean, sometimes, especially I would imagine when you had so many experts telling you, well, this is what you're gonna be able to do, and that's what you're gonna be able to do, and blah, blah, blah. Th there was like a cacophony of voices, I'm sure, and you're in your ear at any given moment. So yes. for you to be able to just say, this doesn't feel right to me, we have to learn to listen to that voice inside of us that's saying something's not right. Even if, even if nobody else is saying that around us, because we do have that. We have that instinctive internal like self-preservation thing. This isn't right. So that's when you know you have to do something about it. Yeah, I completely agree. Hey, and we had uh, Jen, Jen Crompton's watching. She's like, what the? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a notification so, right before we came online. There was a notification in Brilliantly Resilient that said, I posted about you being on today and, and I have to send it to you. It literally says, Jen Crompton, uh, uh, Jen Cronenberger, and Jennifer Robinson like your <laughs> post. I'm like, it's like yeah. Jen's world. Like, they're scared. two of my favorite people in the world, those two Jens. Like, I, I, yeah. I didn't realize you guys all knew each other. I'm like, of course they do. Yes. Of course they do. It just was so funny. I'm like, the Jens have taken over. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I love it. All right. So unfortunately, we gotta. We could probably talk to you for another three hours, but we got to start winding up. So tell us a couple of things. I want you to kind of, and I, I'm probably putting you on the spot here, but if you could say one thing, one sentence to somebody dealing with a challenge about how to think about moving forward. And again, we're keeping in mind that not everybody has the major things, just anything about how to look at moving forward. What would that be? I mean, it would be one of those cliche statements that I really live by, which is choose happiness, you know, and it doesn't mean like rainbows and roses every day. It just means something has to click in your head that you're going to take whatever steps you need to so that you're not in the low point. And also, you know, Jen said something on her show yesterday, which is also something I've been sharing with people. So I wanted to repeat it and I'm sure I won't get it exactly right. But essentially it was think about everything you've been through and every challenge. Here you are. You've survived it. You every survived time it, you yeah. thought you weren't going to do it, you did it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here you yeah. are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to stay in that kind of low um, unless you're really unwilling to, you know, put it out there and get help and help yourself. Uh, so whatever you're going through, I truly believe that you can reinvent and rise. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we we talk about that idea of make the decision that you're just visiting that place. You're not going to live there in that bad spot. You're not going to live there. You're going to move out and you're going to choose happiness. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now tell us where we can find you, where people can connect with you because you're going to have a lot more tribe members. after. And that group, that group on Facebook too. Yes, the group yeah, yes, the, that you the started. The group on Facebook is called Social Survival Guide and there's a graphic with like a hand and a dog, of course. I was going to say, isn't there a dog on there? I remember the dog. <laughs> Um, how can people find me? So um, I'm at Jennifer at PurposefulNetworking.com, my email website, PurposefulNetworking.com, uh, Twitter and Instagram at are you networked, A-R-E-Y-O-U networked, um, of course, LinkedIn and um, Facebook and all that fun stuff. So. Well, we cannot thank you enough for being with us today. It was, a, as we expected fully, this was going to be a wonderful conversation and you certainly never disappoint. And um, I think I can speak for Kristen when I say we, we're both delighted to have you in our tribe and, and have had these connections that we've had over the years. They've been wonderful for us. So yeah, can't absolutely. thank you enough. And I'm so happy we never yeah. share you with a room full of people. We got to just do all the talking. <laughs> I mean, I, I really admire you guys so much and what you're doing. And, you know, you've both inspired me in so many ways over the years, even if you may not realize it just from afar, you know, even though we're not in communication every day, I mean, you guys are definitely part of the tribe of people that always inspire, inspire me. 
So thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, I'm very excited about it. Well, thank you. And everybody, you really have to connect with Jennifer Robinson. She's amazing, as you've already seen. So thank you for joining us, everybody. Another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. And we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>